Welcome everybody to this platform con talk where we'll discuss really one of the hottest latest trends in platform engineering, which is platform orchestration and why this is deeply changing the way that especially enterprise engineer organizations are building their internal developer platforms. So when you're a platform team, right, you want to usually build something like this, right? This is a reference architecture for a multi-cloud internal developer platform based on AWS and GCP. Um, and this is built using the blueprints that we actually shared at PlatformCon 23 last year together with McKinsey. Um, and here you can see, right, you have effectively five different planes, the usual, you have a developer control plane, an integration and delivery plane, monitoring and logging, security, and then infrastructure and resources on your right-hand side. This is how enterprise grade internal developer platforms usually look like. But the question is, if you're a platform team, where do you start, right? Um, and here's really where I think I see a lot of teams going the wrong way. Um, and so if we, if we zoom in here, this is actually a, a, a simpler example. It's just at AWS. You don't have the multi-cloud component here. Um, but you could see effectively you have a front end and you have a back end, right? The front end is your developer control plane, right? That is what both developers and platform teams actually use to interface themselves with the platform, right? Uh, to interact with the platform. Um, and so you'll have stuff like portals, you have stuff like score for code-based uh, interaction, you have stuff like uh, the resource packs, which is um, the, the kind of the, the you know, how, uh, uh, how platform teams configure things. And then you have the backend, right? And here you have your CI CD pipeline, you have your registry, and you have an orchestration layer, right? So now the question is, why not start from the front end, right? That's what a lot of teams actually do. And there is a problem with that, right? Um, and so again, if we zoom in, that's what I mean with the front end, right? And, you know, usually what people really mean when they talk about front end is a portal is I slap a nice portal like backstage on top of my existing setup. I'm doing platform engineering, fantastic, solving all my problems. And that's not really true, right? This is actually a definition by, uh, uh, by Gardner that explains that internal developer portals or portals for short are simply an interface, right? Um, through which developers can discover and access the underlying platform capabilities. Right, so that's really important. Um, here, there's a there's a graphic that I'm that I'm linking to from actually uh, the the Gardner paper. But if you think about it, right, if you step back for a second, think about it, building an, an internal developer platform is a little bit like building a house, right? And the thing is, here you would never start building a house from the door or the windows, right? And that's what it what it is actually what you're actually doing if you're starting. Um, building your platform by putting a portal on top, right? Um, and the problem is, and we all know this from, you know, years now, decades of microservice architecture design, that this A, violates the single responsibility principle, right? Because you should have front-end modules, back-end modules, and they're only responsible for that specific thing. Um, and it also actually then exposes your business logic and certain vulnerabilities if you do what everybody that starts with a, with a portal ends up doing, which is, okay, now I have this nice UI layer, and now I need to start building logic into my platform, and I, I'm going to start like squeezing it in and shoehorning it in and trying to make it work when that's really just not the place for it, right? Um, and so there's actually a very interesting article on platformengineering.org uh, by Aaron Erickson, who built the, uh, the internal developer platform at Salesforce, almost a decade ago. And that's what he, that's the way he explained it, right? Like if you building it in IDP is like building a house and you definitely don't want to start with the door. You want to start with the foundation first. You want to start with the back end of your platform, right? So it's really important that, you know, you know, portals are a very crucial part of platform engineering and doing and building your platform and everything. But it's really important that you understand, okay, if you're asking yourself as a platform team, where do I start from? You want to start from the back end, and, and that's what we're going to explore in this talk, right? So then the question is like, all right, I want to start from the back end. That's great. Got that. But which 
design, which architecture should I look at? And really there are two main sort of compares, if you will. One is pipeline-based backends, right? And this is something that you're, is, is kind of what we're all used to in the last, you know, five or 10 years, uh, which is just having this like, you know, pipeline-based um, pipeline based sort of design. And if you, if you think about the reference architecture that I showed earlier, right, this is the backend, and you could just remove the orchestration layer from here and just say, okay, well, I have uh, GitHub Actions of my CI, I have a, a registry, and I have some deployment solution, and that deployment solution will be connected to my IAC, like a Terraform or Crossplane as a layer on top for Kubernetes deployments, stuff like that, right? Fantastic. So that's usually what most people think about when they're like, okay, here's, here's my backend design for the platform, right? Okay, so what's great and what's not so great about it? Well, what's great is that, you know, we're all used to that. So usually doesn't require too much change from the status quo and it doesn't create too much friction in terms of adoption internally. The issue though is this is a start stop system. It is actually not designed to have advanced logic built into it, right? So it's designed to do this kind of like progression type of logic, environment progression and so on. But it won't scale to things like developers interacting with your infrastructure in a self-service uh, manner, right? And so it's very interesting because you end up in a similar scenario as if you start with a front end, which is you, you are basically trying to show hard logic into a place that it shouldn't be. Um, and so it's not as bad as just starting with a portal, right? You still have a backend. You probably have a portal on top of this pipeline-based backend. So that's fine. But the key thing is you are, you know, you can't really scale to more complex logic flows. And that is really the issue with this type of, um, with this type of, of backends. And what happens over and over again is that uh, the complexity explodes in this type of designs, right? So this is a, an example of like a, you know, a, a very abstracted pipeline where you have step one, step two is a, is a check from somebody, step three, I'm calling it Terraform and some other repo, step four, I'm calling another, another um, actual pipeline that then is triggered and then, uh, you know, bring something back as a result and so on. And so you can see how this is getting, as you're adding more and more logic to the system, to your platform, you're nesting, uh, you know, a, 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 a pipeline into another pipeline, into another pipeline, and then this pipeline calls that pipeline and so on, right? And it just becomes really, really unwieldy to maintain. And, you know, you're kind of back to square one, really, with this, because, you know, it, you're buying yourself more time, let's say, than if you don't have something like this, but eventually it will come and get you and you'll have to pay for that. Um, and so it's not really scalable at all. All right, so what's the alternative? The alternative is graph-based backend designs uh, or effectively what we call platform orchestrators. This is a talk that a friend of the community at all gave at the tag app delivery um, in, um, I believe this was in Chicago um, at this at the at KubeCon uh, with the CNCF working group, um, and you know he was explaining he's introducing this concept of a platform orchestrator where you usually have an abstract uh, developer request and that is matched by the orchestrator against the rules set by the platform engineering team, and then fresh new application infrastructure configurations are created in this graph based. Uh, sort of representation of your workload. Now that sounds like a very complex. Let, let's break that down. Um, and so if we if we if we break down the, the first bit, right? Developers are requesting infrastructure, right? Because that's really where the complex logic comes in. Um, they can do that through a portal, like a backstage, so a UI. They can do that through a CLI, an API, a good orchestration system, a good platform has different interfaces that the platform team can provide to their developers depending on what's the right level of abstraction and context that they, they like and they want to provide to them. 
Um, so in this case, we'll look at SCORE because it's an open source workload specification. It's a code based interface, which we find is usually what developers like most because it's just a YAML file and they're used to that. They don't need to log into some um, weird UI and um, click things around, which they usually don't particularly love. And so in this case, you can see here, I'm a developer and OSA is like, hey, I have a service that's called product service. And I literally describe in a very abstracted way what that service needs, right? It needs a database of type Postgres, a bucket of type S3 and so on and so forth, right? The, the crucial thing here to note is I don't need to specify any, um, any, any implementation details, right? I don't need to say Postgres v 14.3 and so on. I don't need to do any of that. I just say, hey, I have a service and it needs a Postgres, done. And then what the orchestrator does, what the, what the graph-based um, sort of backend of your platform does is it takes, um, it, 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 uh, it basically takes in the rules set by the platform teams. This is done in a way where you effectively just specify different research definitions, different rules on how the uh, infrastructure is supposed to be consumed by your developers. And that's really where the logic is, right? So either your platform team or your infrastructure and operations team, that's where they, they'll they build in this logic. Then you have the developer interacting with score, right? And so let's say in this case, you know, you, the, you can just assume the, 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 the score file that you just seen, right? Um, you have a, a, a product, a, a service called product service. And I declare some dependencies as a developer with a score file. I do a git push. It gets built from the CI. The CI notifies the orchestrator that then goes and picks up the uh, the the actual built image in uh, from from the from your uh, from your registry. So if you look at the at the ref architecture that we were looking at earlier, that will be your ECR. And then here's the here's the powerful thing: the platform orchestrator reads in the request. It understand the context, right? Which is like, hey, the developer wants a Postgres and is deploying to staging, right? As as an example, and so what it does is it goes and picks up this, um, it goes and and does this matching, right? So it reads in the request, it matches it to the 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 rules set by the infrastructure and operations team or the platform team, and so say, hey, for context staging, anti Postgres use the recent definition uh, Postgres RDS staging. Right, and then what it does is it creates a graph-based representation of your workload, right, with its different dependencies. A DNS in this case, it would have an S3 bucket as well. If we were following the the previous core file, here's a, the EKS, your EKS cluster, and you have your your RDS uh, instance already provisioned. Now let's say that a developer now wants to add another dependency. So for instance, on a cache of type Redis, all they do, they add in the score file, two lines of code, cache, type Redis, fantastic. It gets, um, it, it, again, it, it gets built, right? Git push. The platform worker share then understands, hey, I need to use for context staging and type cache, the, the recent definition elastic cache Redis, and it creates a new representation of your workload, right? So you'll see here deployment 99. Now you see deployment 100 but with a new representation of the workload with the new dependency and that gets provisioned to your, um, everything gets provisioned and deployed to your clusters or handed over to an existing um, deployment solution like an Argo CD or whatever, right? But the, the key thing of the orchestration is that it orchestrates this, this, this complex logic and it makes it very, very easy because the complexity that is surfaced back up to the developers is almost zero, right? It's literally they all just need to they just need to add uh, what they need for their workload to run in a very abstract way. Nothing else. Everything else, all the logic is built in, and this allows the infrastructure and operations team to sleep well at night because you know that only the latest uh, vetted resource definition or rules or templates is being used by your uh, developers automatically. And so then um, the orchestrator, uh, you know, this, this sort of graph-based backends not only do this type of, of, complex logic, they, of complex logic, they also manage progression between environments, right? Um, and so you're not losing that pipeline functionality, right? Um, and so, for example, you could do like a Git push, you build this research graph, 
generate new app and infrastructure configurations. Then you could trigger a policy check that returns. It triggers a human sign off that returns, yada, 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 right? You, you trigger to your Slack or, or Teams or whatever. You update the portal to show changes, and then you keep pushing forward to production. This is this. So you still have this entire pipeline functionality, but with all that complex logic built in, um, which actually doesn't require any complex work, not from the platform team, nor from the developer. And so if developers follow them, this golden paths that the orchestration layer enforces by default, everybody wins, right? We've just looked at this example. If I need a new resource, I only need to add two lines of code. Ops teams, security teams don't need to be involved at all. Um, same with a new environment. Um, and let's say, you know, for instance, you want to up, upgrade a, a Postgres instance, right? From V14 to V15. Right now, if you are the infrastructure and operations team, you'd have to go one by one to application development teams and figure out, okay, what are you, you know, what instance are you using? Update it, you know, security should also be involved probably. Um, and so everybody's involved right now in this type of setup, right? All you do is you update one file, security maybe vets it, and that's it. Then you know that it will automatically be rolled out across all deployments um, according to your rollout policies automatically, right? And it will be enforced uh, across all workflows and across all dev teams. Great, uh, we're not gonna cover all of that, uh, but that's really the, the pros and cons, right? Um, in general, this type of graph-based backend design checks all the boxes of good design, right? It's API first, supports multiple interfaces right out of the box. It, you can easily build in RB, RBC, SSO, and so on. And it has this automatic uh, sign-off, secret injection, all those things it comes with, right? But importantly, it lets you build this complex logic by default uh, inside of your platform engineering setup. Um, on the on the con side of things, right? It requires a new mindset, it's a new thing. Um, and and that can be challenging, right? Uh, and so that's that's where it's important to have pre clear rollout strategies. And then finally, really, this type of system makes sense at scale, right? 50 plus developers, I would say even more, 100, 150 plus developers. That's really where the systems have uh, shown a lot of power in uh, different platform setups. Good. So just to wrap it up, you know, where do you want to where where to start from the back end, not the front end. And if you're at scale, if you're a serious enterprise organization, you need to look at graph based backends for your platform engineering initiative. Um, and I really think that uh, the, the value from a platform team perspective is in knowing your organization. Um, and so I would really say the, the value of a platform team is in doing this last mile optimization and not trying to build everything from scratch and reinvent the wheel. So I really advocate for a, uh, you know, a buy and blend type of strategy um, for, for, more platform, for most platform engineering teams. Um, and importantly, you want to start small and show value quickly, right? Um, and so we've uh, recently spoken a lot about this idea of the minimum viable platform in the community. This is something that is really, really important precisely to avoid this problem, right? That because it requires a new mindset, you're risking of getting stuck because you don't get enough internal buy-in. And so make sure that you start small, iterate quickly, prove value to all the different stakeholders. And that's how you get started on your platform engineer initiative. Thank you so much. And... Come join me um, for the Q&A in the Slack.